Great. I think we've got the number. Um, so I'm gonna begin. Um let me make Rosemond uh a co-host as well, so that um if there's anything that needs to be done, she can do that. Right. Okay. Um my name is Prince, uh Prince Adam Samu. I'm a biomedical engineer by certificate, right, from undergrad. Um, but now I do more in synthetic biology and um genetic design and protein expression and protein purification related work. Um so today's lecture is gonna be on um useful parts in symbio. Um and it's gonna be a bit different from the style probably I used to. Um I need to um I need you guys to like um give me feedback um when I you know give me feedback ask questions and you can either put the questions on the um any question you have on the chat or you can just raise your hand and then um I'll call you then you ask your question. So um my facilitator will be Rosemond for today but um Kato is also um available if there is any um logistics issue. Um so we're gonna go ahead um right so um what we are going to cover today um uh, mostly will be um about um promoters um rbs affinity tags um report exterminators um coding sequence vector backbone and then look at um some of the dna assembly standards that are quite useful um in um doing genetic um doing your genetic design so the ones that i chose are ones that are highly standardized and almost every lab um uses that sort of um um standards to design their genetic circuit. So with this in mind, um if you're able to understand this um approach, um basically any design that you need to do um will be very easy for you. And then it's going to be compatible with um existing designs that in case you want to include your design into an existing design, it becomes very easy for you. So that's why I chose those um particular um assembly standards. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is um a quote from um Richard Feynman, which says that um what can I what what I cannot create, I do not understand. Um and then so what the reason behind me putting this here today is that um by the end of this lesson, you should really grasp the concept of um the components that you need um to be able to design whatever genetic circuit that you need um based on what um problem um that you have right so based on the problem that you're going to choose um you can design whatever genetic design circuit that you need to be able to solve um that particular problem and let's keep in mind that um as part of the assignment one thing um that you have to do as part of the assignment is that you need to identify a problem and then basically use everything we are talking about today to design a genetic circuit to solve that problem, right? So you need to be basically be able to use all the components we have here to be able to solve a particular problem of your choosing, right? So you have to decide whatever problem you have going to look at. And as part of our um, activity session, um, I created some um, tools here that we are going to use to be able to um, design um, any genetic circuit. And then I'm also going to take you through some online platforms, free tools and softwares that you can actually use to um, design or create whatever genetic circuit that you want to use, right? All right. So now, so the, there is a, a particular order in which um, your designs have to be in, right? So um, basically, you have a promoter, you have RBS, you have affinity tags, you have reporters, you have cleave, you have coding sequence, and you have terminators you have a particular order that these things have to be in. Most importantly, always your promoter and then your terminator, the order doesn't change, right? So your promoter RBS and then the terminator, the order doesn't change. But in between your tag, your reporter, your clip, and then your coding sequence, it can be changed as in how you want your design to look like. So what we're gonna do in the next couple of slides is to basically take each of these um, components, each of these elements that you need to incorporate into your design and basically um, throw a bit more light on what they are and how they contribute to um, 
the design as a whole, right? And so basically that's what we are gonna do. So if you have any question, don't um, hesitate to stop me and ask your question, right? All right, so um, a promoter is basically like a switch, right? Um, you know how when you are, um, so like a switch that regulates, um, that sort of um, controls whatever um, you wanna do, right? So in genetic um, terms, so the promoter is a region um, of a gene um, where a relevant protein binds to um, a transcription to um, a unit to transcribe that gene, right? So basically it is the portion of your DNA sequence. So you have a very long DNA sequence. It is a portion of the gene relevant to proteins, right? That binds to initiate the transcription of a gene. So if the promoter is not there, um, you can't initiate the transcription of a gene. So that is why the promoter is important, right? So the in order to basically um, determine how you are going to produce your protein or like the expression level of your protein. So basically, if I say protein, it's basically enzymes. So if you want to do, um, if you want to produce insulin, insulin is a protein. So basically whatever protein that you want to produce, the promoter that you choose to use, the promoter in front of that protein is going to determine how much of the protein you're going to be able to produce because every promoter has a way of um, affecting um, what uh, the output of that um, transcription is, right? So basically promoters are usually 100 to 1,000 base pair long, but you can sometimes have some promoters that are shorter than um, 100. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then they are located at the um, the upstream, right? So in a gene sequence, um, if we see um, where my case is down here, right? On the five prime, um, end right so we, we see how a dna looks like the top is a three prime from your left to your right the top is a three prime and five prime and at the bottom um the complementary strand is your starts with the three prime right so the promoter is on the five prime right and then it's on the um upstream of um your five prime right where the five prime region is or what so we call the five prime strand the the sense strand and then we call the three prime strand the antisense strand. So basically, your promoter is on the five prime um region or the what we call the sense strand, right? So what basically happens is that so first of all, we look at um um the image on the left again. Um, so you have a, a long DNA strand with a promoter. Um, so once the promoter is activated or whatever um the promoter is supposed to activate is activated. The RNA polymerase then binds to um, that region and allows the translation of um, everything that is supposed to be after the promoter. If the promoter is not triggered, then nothing happens in that reaction. Is that okay? And so I'm not. I put this here. I'm not going to bore you with all these things. But basically, um, even in a in a in a promoter, there are um, elements in a, every promoter, right? So a study has been done um for a while now and then they realized that um so the you see um in the box down here we have the elements and then the sequence so the most studied um of these um elements in every single promoter is what we call the TATA box right so this is basically the the element that has been studied the most and it is located from the from approximately like 24 to 31 base pairs upstream of the translation site so what this basically does is that during transcription, the TATA um, binding protein, which is what we call the TBP of the transcription um, factor, binds um, this sequence and bends the DNA to commence the, trans um, the recruitment of the transcription um, machine, right? So that is what basically, even within the um, promoter, we said that the promoter basically initiates um, or triggers the transcription of your system. However, even within that promoter, it is this element that actually triggers um, the expression of or the translation of your system. Right. So I mentioned that, um, so basically we have several types of promoters, right? We have several types of promoters, but we can basically categorize them into um, quantity promoter and then inducible promoter. So quantity promoter basically um, deals with, or when we say quantity promoter, it means that you don't need any external um, switch to turn that um, promoter on, right? So it 
basically being expressed constantly in the system. However, inducible promoter, you need to trigger it. So examples of inducible promoters are like the, the lack promoter, which is basically triggered by lactose. You have UV promoter, which is basically triggered by um any UV um light. And so we have like a several promoters um that are triggered by whatever um function that they they are meant to trigger. So I mentioned that um promoters basically the strengths are different, right? So for example, even if you want to use a quantity promoter, not every quantity promoter functions the same way, right? And even if you pick one quantity promoter, how it's going to um, affect the expression of your protein is different from how another quantity promoter is going to affect the, um, the expression of your protein. So basically, sometimes when you are doing experiments, you have to basically screen a lot of promoters to actually see which of these promoters allows for high yield of your protein. Because even some data will say, okay, when you use um, the J23115, it has a high yield. But basically, or when you go into what you want to use your promoter for, the expression is not the same, right? The, the yield of the expression is not the same because it differs based on um, the organism that you're using that is even one, and then the protein that you're trying to express, right? So those are the two different things that you want to understand here that constant promoters are ex um, express the proteins const as constant level at the, um, in the organism, whilst inducible promoters, you have to um, actually trigger the system um, by activating um, your gene or your circuit with whatever promoter that you're using. So if you're using a lack promoter, then you need to induce or trigger um, the system by what making whatever. So if, for example, if you're growing your bacteria in the bioreactor, you have to make sure that you have the lactose environment for the gene to trigger the expression of whatever protein that you're trying to make, right? If you have any question, you can just put it in the chat and then uh, I will respond to you. All right. Uh, right. Okay. Now, the next thing we are going to talk about is what we call the ribosome binding site. So just like um, the name says, it's a um, the sequence that binds to um, the ribosome um, during the initiation of the translation, right? So basically, they are found on... No, so even though I say they are found on the RNA, mRNA, you actually put it as part of your DNA, right? So in your DNA design, you're going to put an RBS there, and then during the translation, um, it's converted to um, mRNA, and then, right? So it is that mRNA that binds to the ribosome to allow for the translation of um, your protein. So what basically happens is that the RBS binds to the ribosome. So you know in the in the machinery um, of the organism, it is a ribosome that is responsible for the translation, right? Making the proteins, right? So there should be a sequence that is going to be recognized by the ribosome to allow for the translation to occur, right? So if you talk about promoters, promoters are what that triggers um, they are the system or the, the initiators of the translation and um, the transcription into the um, um, RNA. And then you have the ribosome binding site, which is basically going to attach itself to the ribosome and allow for the translation of um, whatever protein that um, you want to um, produce. Now, again, there are several things that you have to take into account when you are selecting a ribosome um, binding site sequence for your design, right? So I put um, a couple of data here. So the first one here was a paper um, that was trying to see the expression level of um, valentine, um, laxantine, right? So they used um, a wild type RBS and then they used several RBS. So when you see the first data here, this was expression in GM101. And then this was expression in GM101DE3. So these are different strains of E. coli, right? So don't, don't put your head about that. So these are different strains of E. coli. Now you realize that even with the same um, RBS in one particular E. coli, the expression level is very low as compared to um, in another strain of E. coli, right? And then when you look at the data over here, this was, um, they were trying to produce um, a particular fluorescence um, protein, the expression in the fluorescence protein. And then they realized that um, different RBS produces um, 
um, changes the expression or the expression yield of whatever protein that you have to produce. So again, it is very important that you understand what RBS that you have and how does it um, affect the protein that you're going to produce. And this is very hard to do. So basically, before you can do that, you have to, again, screen a lot of RBS. And usually in a, in a low resource settings like this, you don't have the resources to be able to screen a lot of promoters or to be able to screen a lot of RBS. So what we sometimes use is what we call the RBS calculator, where it basically uses um, the data from um, the RBS sequence and then your um, your coding sequence to predict what, um, based on the, and, and the energies involved, predicts what the yield will be. This is not 100% accurate, it's just a prediction. So sometimes it predicts that, okay, you can use this particular RBS, but typically when you go in the lab, you don't get um, the expected yield, right? So sometimes you have to screen a lot of them, or sometimes you have to look at what do you want to do? What do you want to express? Has somebody expressed that before? Go to literature and find what sort of, um, what type of RBS did they use? What kind of um, organism did they use? And then maybe you can get some data out of it. But if you don't have any data, it's either you screen a lot of them, or you basically look in the literature and find one that has been used with a high yield, right? Right, so the next thing um, that we're gonna talk about is what we call the reporters, right? Um, the reporter gene. So there are several um, reporter genes, but in here, I'm gonna basically just um, describe it as, um, uh, how do we call it? Right, so the reporter genes are those that uh, can easily detect and be measured, avoiding and providing a visible and measurable signal that indicates the presence uh, of a particular gene that you are trying to produce. So sometimes, so for example, let's say you want to express, um, you want to produce insulin, right? Now, insulin, when you produce it, you can't see with your naked eye or unless you have um, an expensive machine like um, um, a nano drop that you can actually check the um, the enzyme activity or the protein activity, or you have a plate reader that you can measure some um, um, protein kinetics. If you don't have those machines, then you wouldn't know whether you've expressed your protein or not, right? So it's going to be in a solution. You don't know whether you've expressed the protein or not. So what you're going to do now is that you're going to go down to do a lot of experiments by um, pre the protein. That is, you assume that the protein is there, right? Then you pre the protein. Then you run SDS page to see if the protein is present in your, in your gel. If the protein is not there, then you go back to your experiment when express again. Now, what the reporters do is that they, they are gene sequence that um, produce visible um, or allows you to basically see if your protein has been produced or not, right? So you attach um, the sequence to um, your coding sequence or whatever you want to express. And then when the protein is expressed, it is expressed together with the reporter gene. So then you can see that. So if you look, for example, if you use um, a GFP reporter as part of your, so you, you are producing um, insulin and then you use the um, GFP as part of your reporters, when the insulin is expressed, you're going to see your bacteria either turning green or when you, um, when you purify your protein, you're going to have um, a green um, protein. Um, kindly mute yourself if you're not asking a question, please. Um, you're going to see a green um, bacteria. Uh, right. You're going to see the bacteria turning green, and that indicates that what your protein has been expressed, right? So that saves you a lot of time, and then helps you be able to actually quantify or do some um, kinetic activity. So, for example, if you want to see how your your promoters work or how your RBS works. If you put it, your chromoproteins behind whatever you're expressing, then because the chromoproteins produce color, then you can use the intensity of the color to determine or to basically tell whether um, your protein has been expressed in a high yield or in a low yield, right? So basically, so quantifying um, the promoter strength. And then also you can use it to actually measure um, transformation efficiency or transfection efficiency. So basically transformation is when you are putting um, a DNA into um, um, a bacteria, right? But when you're putting it into um, a chaotic, we call it transfection, right? You are transfecting it. 
right? So in other ways, it helps you be able to know whether you've really put um your DNA into the system by because then the system is going to change color, right? If it is in there, then the system is going to change color. Is that okay? Right. So these are some of the images. So you can clearly see that you have um the bacteria. So these are all bacteria that have been spinned down from the media. So you have um the E4 red, which looks like pink. Uh, you have um RFP, you have um A blue, you have um ML GFP. So all these colors are basically visible to the naked eye. So the colors that are mostly visible to the naked eye, we call them um chromoproteins, right? The ones that you have to induce before you can see, we call them fluorescent proteins, right? So with this one, um, this image in the middle here, um, they are fluorescent proteins. So you have to basically um use either a dark room or um excite um the bacteria to be able to see the color. Now, when we look at um the last image here, um, it was basically a, an image I picked from a paper that was basically trying to um tag um a viral RNA with a um a fluorescent protein to be able to see which part of an organism has been infected with that particular um um virus, right? So with this, you can basically see that if um the virus has been tagged with a particular um fluorescent protein, then you'll be able to see that okay, this part of this organism has been affected by this particular um virus, and then it helps you basically be able to track um how the viral spreading is done in the organism. And then if you are treating it as well, you get to see um how um your drug is faring because then you're going to see a reduction in the um intensity of the fluorescent protein. Right. Right. Uh I think some oh right. I think I missed something. Right. Um before I went to report it, I think I missed something. Right. Um, so another thing we are going to talk about is what we call um affinity tags. So affinity tags are um basically um some proteins that have high affinity. So if I say high affinity, it's like they they are drawn more to um some elements, right? They are drawn more to some elements. So they're genetically designed to be drawn more to some elements such as um ion or whatever. So these tags have high affinity for specific ligands like ions and all those stuff, allowing for um, efficient purification and detection of a tag protein. So what if, what this um affinity tag does is that so for example, now if you want to produce um insulin, now you know insulin um is to be used by a human being, so you need as pure of insulin as possible you need the insulin to be very pure void of any um contaminants now you know you're going to produce this particular insulin in a bacteria or in a yeast and the the bacteria by itself has it, a lot of proteins within it right so you have to make sure that when you're purifying your protein you take away all the impurities to allow for only the protein of interest to be left um in your system right so this is where the affinity tax comes in so we have some tags such as the his tag so for example um if you look at the um the image on the left here you see so you have you've produced um your proteins and then you have this column here that is um filled with resin now in the protein expression they use um um, the, uh, um what we call the um mbp right so the mbp is the maltose binding protein and this protein basically binds to resins, right? So what is going to happen is that when you produce your protein, your protein is going to be expressed together with the affinity tag, right? As a, a big chunk of protein. Then you pass your protein through the column and this column has the resins in there. So what is going to happen is that the protein, the resin is going to attach itself to the resins in the column. And then you can just wash off every other um, debris that does not have that ability to tag itself to um, whatever affinity um, tag that you have, right? So then once you do that, then you can elute and then get your pure DNA out. So on the right here, this is an image of an experiment I did back um, a while back where I was trying to produce a particular protein. So when we, so in this um, um, well here, what you see is um, pre-induction. So this was, so I was using, um, IPTG or um the lag gene, right? The lag promoter. So basically in the lag promoter, it means that you have to 
induce um, the system for the protein to be expressed because I was using a lack promoter. So this was before I um, before I induced the system, right? This, what you see here is before I induce the system. So everything you see in here is the bacteria, um, the proteins that exist in the bacteria. However, within here, you still see, so this is the protein of interest, right? This is the protein of interest. Within here, you still see that the protein has been produced. Now, this brings me back to the promoters and the RBS that we talked about. Now, even if you have a promoter that is supposed to be induced, we have a system where we call um, we call it leakages, right? Where the, the, the organism starts to produce, um, express your proteins, even though the system has not been triggered. And so this is a classic example that you have here where the, the bacteria started producing the proteins, even though I hadn't told it to start producing the protein by inducing the system with the lactose, um, the lactose, right? So you see that even before I even induce the system, the bacteria has started producing the proteins. So if you want your system to be very airtight, right, where you're not going to have any leakages, where again, I explain leakages as if you're using the um, an inducible promoter, a leakage occurs when the bacteria starts to express the protein without you telling it to express the protein, right? So that is what we call the leakages, right? So you see that we have the leakage here. So this was before on this wall, the pre-induction here is before we induce the system. And then here was when we induced the system, right? And then, so here was when we induced the system and here was more like more of the purification um, system. Now we use um, what we call um, um, ammonium sulfate precipitation. So you see in this wall here at the 40%, we're able to get the protein alone out without any other debris in there, right? Without any other of the, um, the bacteria um, protein in there. So this is the importance of the tag that I was talking about, right? Because it helps you purify and separate your important proteins from any other protein in the environment, right? If you have any question, um, you can just let me know and then I will respond to that in a bit. Okay. All right, let's go on. So we've talked about the reporters already where it's basically helping you see. So the affinity tags do not help you see. They help you separate, right? But as to whether you have produced your proteins, you wouldn't be able to know unless you run this basically again. So if we have, if you don't use um, a reporter gene in your system, what is going to happen is that you have to do all these experiments to get here to see if your protein has been expressed in there. If you run this ex um, experiment and you don't see anything in your world, so for example, if this is where I loaded my protein, right, and I don't see anything in there, it means that your protein wasn't expressed and you've wasted resources all the way from um, lysing the bacteria to running the gel, right? So when you use a reporter gene, then you're going to see the bacteria changing color if the protein has been expressed and then it makes life very easier for you, right? Now, terminators. Um, Prince. Yes. There is some. There is some question in the chat. Ah, right. Ah. Uh, uh, um. Okay. Um. So the um. The um the molecular weight um lane is the first one. Um. So it wasn't the first one. It was basically the last one. Give me a second um here it was the last one i used here right so i didn't put um so sometimes what happens is that you are in a hurry to load your proteins you forget to put your molecular weight ladder in there and then you put it in the last one right so um in the last one this is the molecular weight um ladder or the protein ladder so what basically um let me explain what the protein ladder is so the protein ladder is um some predetermined um protein sizes right now, every protein has a, every protein you express has a, a weight or a size, right? Now, to know whether you actually produce that specific protein, you have to, when you run the SDS page, you have to match your, the size of your protein to a predetermined um, ladder, right? Or a predetermined molecular weight, right? And that is what we call the molecular weight ladder, right? So that is what we have here, right? And it's basically in kilo Dalton, right? So, this is what the molecular weight ladder is, and this is what we 
you typically some people say you load it in the first row, but hey, nobody cares which row you load it in. So far as you load it, and then you can actually confirm that your sizes, the, the size of your protein that you produce is actually correct. That is all that matters. Nobody cares whether you load it in the first one or you load it in the last wall. Nobody actually um bothers about that. Right. Um, how do you avoid leakages? Um uh, sometimes you can use um what we call um uh one second right so sometimes it's about the promoter that you're using right so for example if you're using a running um a lack promoter if there is leakages then you have to change the promoter right so there are a lot of um, modifications of the lack promoter so you have to change the promoter to see if it's going to um um reduce it if not there is another um uh approach where you put um so there is a promoter and then we have another gene called the um um it's like um it prevents the um the expression of um the transcription of your protein if the promoter hasn't been um activated right but that one particular one it's not every you don't have it for every promoter right so it doesn't always work right the leakages, you don't, it's sometimes very hard to avoid leakages. Like it's very, very hard to avoid leakages, right? But for example, if you want to produce uh, insulin, sometimes I don't see what is wrong with leakages, right? But leakages become a problem when you are co-culturing, um, you are co-culturing um, different organisms, right? So for example, if you want to um, produce, um, you are growing E. coli in the presence of yeast, where you want the yeast to express something to trigger um, um, the bacteria to produce whatever it needs to produce, then if you have leakages, then that is a problem. Is that okay? So it, it depends. It depends. You basically have to, again, go back and screen a lot of proteins to be um, promoters to be able to avoid um, these leakages. Or you find, um, um, I've forgotten the term, but I'll find it and then just let you know in a bit, right? Um, is there any... All right. Um, it says that um, some strains of um lactic acid bacteria are known to produce um cobalamin, that's vitamin B twelve, but in low quantities, is there a uh, is there a means to genetically manipulate the promoter region of this gene responsible for? Um, this process in those bacteria so that they can overproduce it. Um, there is um, so that is basically going into um metabolic engineering, right? That is you wanna you want to um engineer or manipulate the metabolism of that bacteria. That is a different case. With that one, you have to knock out some genes. You have to introduce some genes, and it is quite different, right? But what we are trying to do here, so for example, if you want to produce this vitamin B12, is there um the gene that put is there the gene that produces this particular um vitamin, right? Is this the part a gene that part that produces this particular vitamin? So if there is a gene, then basically you go through the system to actually produce it in a different organism. So if you want to produce it in, let's say, um a bo 21 d 3 organism, then you can, or if you want to produce it in a yeast, then you can do it. So basically. You have a promoter where the promoter can be induced by anything, right? You can say, okay, I want to induce um my my system by using that. So if I'm going into the bacteria, I want to induce my system with the um IPTG. So I'm going to use a lack promoter, right? So if I have a lack promoter, I have RBS, then I'm going to put the gene that codes for the coding sequence, right? So the gene that codes for the uh, cobalamine. Then if I put in the bacteria, then a bacteria can produce this um particular um vitamin for you in in that excess that you want but if you want to um manipulate the bacteria that originally does that then you have to do a lot of uh, metabolic engineering where you're going to knock out some genes or introduce some genes and that is quite <laughs> difficult than sin um, doing doing synthetic biology where you're going to design a circuit that produces um this particular um protein that you're looking for is that okay um, so can you artificially synthesize promoters? Yeah, so basically all promoters can be synthesized, right? Like, I mean, there is a, so so we have two things, right? You can either read a gene or write a gene. 
So to read a gene, what we call, um, so to write a gene is what we call the um, synthesis. And then to read a gene is what we call the sequencing, right? So you can basically synthesize any gene at all. All you have to do, so far as you have your gene, you send it to these companies that have um, the means to synthesize it. They synthesize and send it back to you, right? So they are not, so all these genes were identified somewhere in some organism, but then through synthetic biology, you can have the sequence and then basically send it out to a particular company and then they can synthesize it for you, right? Then you can use it in the lab as you want it, right? So everything that exists, every gene that exists in nature, you can basically synthesize it. And some of those companies are IDT and Twist and they can do it for you um, at a fee, right? Right. Okay. So then we can continue. Right. So now you have your promoter, you have your RBS, you have your tag, you have your, um, we haven't talked about the coding sequence yet. I'm going to talk about coding sequence in a bit, right? And then you have your terminator. Now the terminator is what tells the, um, the RBS to stop making the protein, right? Is what tells the RBS to stop making the protein. And it does it in, in two ways, right? So the first one is, so it is, it, it, it's able to, so the terminator is able to communicate with the system to stop the polymerase, the RNA polymerase to stop um, the trans transcription and the translation because of two things. One, the helping structure. So this is what we call the helping structure. This right here, right? This this thing here is what we call the, the helping structure. And then the U rich region, which is what we have here, right? So this is the U rich, U rich region. So what happens is that when the RNA polymerase encounters the terminator sequence, right, which is this sequence here, the formation of the stable helping structure. So what the what the U rich region does is that it destabilizes, <clears throat> um, the it destabilizes the um the polymerase and then causes it to release itself from um <clears throat> the sequence thereby. So it's basically going to cause it to fall off the sequence. And then it stops um, the the translation of um, whatever protein that you are doing, right? So uh, when the RNA polymerase encounters the terminator sequence, the formation of um, the step, um, the helping structure, and then the destabilization causes the urease region to lead to release the RNA transcription and then dissociate the RNA polymerase from the DNA template, right? So basically, that is how it functions. Now, this. Terminator, so a terminator is basically different from a stop codon. And I'm sure you should know that by now, right? That a terminator is different from a stop codon. A stop codon basically is like a it's a it's a three um three um or it's an amino acid, let me put that way, or it's a three um code um nucleotide, it's a three um nucleotide code that basically says that um a particular transcription unit stops here. Right now, even though it stops there, it doesn't tell the RNA polymerase to fall off. So if you put the stop code on, let's say you are designing your system and then you say you forget to put your terminator there at the end of your circuit. But then you think, oh, because I have um, a stop code on at the end of my um, um, sequence, right? So whatever you want to express. Now, every protein at the end of it has a stop code on, right? So you're, if you assume that, Oh, because I have a stop code on at the end of my sequence, so then it is going to stop the line. What is going to happen is that it is going to continue to um, produce what is at the end of it, and then what then going to happen is that the secondary structure of your protein and the tertiary structure of your protein and overall function of your protein is going to be different from what it's supposed to normally be. Right. So keep in mind that. Stop codons do not stop the functioning of um, the RNA polymerase, thereby stopping the um, the protein that you're trying to produce, right? However, if you want to stop that, then you need the um, terminator. And when you go through the iGEM registry, they have like a bunch of terminators that have been tested, um, but they have a bunch of terminators that have been tested that you can basically use any of them um, to do your experiments or to design your circuits. Right, 
Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is um finding your coding sequence. I think in one of your lectures you talked about um the Uniprot and they are using the NCBI to find um your sequence. I'm not going to talk about it so much, but I just brought it here to show you that um basically when you go to NCBI and then you have um you change your format here to nucleotides, um it basically gives you the the nucleotide sequence of whatever protein that you're looking for. And then you can use that to um, design, um, to put into your system, to design whatever protein that you're trying to produce, right? So you can use this tool, and I'm sure you probably know other tools that you can use, but this is my go-to tool that I use. Or sometimes I go read papers, but reading papers is very tedious and very boring. So I don't like reading papers. If I know the protein I'm looking for, I just go to NCBI and then it makes my life very easy. Right, so that is where you find your sequence. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is, well, not the last thing, but like in terms of what you need to design your circuit, the last thing we're going to talk about is what we call the um the plasmid vector backbone, right? So now, going back to the beginning, you realize that I said you have a promoter, you have um you have a RBS, you have, so let's assume that you're using promoter, RBS, a tag, a coding sequence, a reporter, and a terminator, right? So you have this, this sequence. Now, this sequence is linearized, right? You can't put this sequence alone in a bacteria. You need to close it up, right? You need to um, right. You need to close up your your sequence um to form the circular shaped plasmid that you want to be able to give it to um the bacteria. So that is where the the vector backbone comes in, right? So a vector backbone, basically, I think you talked about this in one of your your lectures, but I brought it here because it is going to form an integral part of um how you design your process, um, your your system. So I brought it back here, right? So mostly a vector backbone contains your A B, um, your multiple cloning sites, and then your origin of application, right? Your antibiotic is um basically the antibiotic gene, right? So the gene that produces um the antibiotic resistance protein that protects the or that protects the, the bacteria to allow you to do selection, right? So the antibiotics allow you to do selection, right? And then the origin of replication is that portion of um, your DNA, um, that portion of the plasmid where the bacteria makes multiple copies of that plasmid, right? So that is where you have that. And then the MSC is the multiple cloning site. Um, it is where um, it allows you to put in your design sequence, right? So it has some um, it has some um, restriction sites that allow you to easily um, put that in, um, design your system and then put that in, right? Right, so um, what are some of the factors to consider when selecting the backbone? Now, sometimes selecting the backbone, now there are a lot of backbones out there, like several of them, like a lot, right? Um, we have the P jump. We have um a lot of them, right? So, what do you use to decide, or how do you determine what um vector backbone do you you want to use, right? So, it is to to decide that it is you you do that based on what is important to you, right? So, when you go back to um the origin of replication of your plasmid, right? The origin of replication basically influences the copy number of your of your um your system right so when we talk about copy number it is um the number of copies that a single bacteria can have right the number of copies of a um the plasmid that a single bacteria can have in it right so we have as low as like 20 to as high as like 17 um 700 right so we have a plasmid with a low copy number we have a plasmid with a medium copy number we have a plasmid with a lot a high copy number so you decide, okay, I want a vector backbone that allows my system to have a high copy number plasmid. So then, okay, then I'm going to choose a, a backbone with that. Um, or I want a backbone with the ampicillin resistance gene, or I want a backbone with the chlorophenicol, or I want a backbone with that. Now, with that, it, is, it depends on what you have in your lab, right? So for example, in my lab, we have um, ampicillin, we have canamycin, we have chlorophenicol. So if I'm choosing a vector backbone to design anything, I have to look at this. I can't choose any other vector backbone that has um, any other antibiotic because then I have to go and buy it. And right now I don't want to buy anything, right? So 
I basically have to rely on what I have, right? So you have to look at that. Um, so we've talked about two things, right? You have to look at the copy number. You have to look at um the the antibiotic um selection um portion. Now, why is some copy number I mean good over other copy number? Now, someone will say, oh, if I want to express a protein, then I need a protein of it. I mean, I need a protein to be of like high um yield so that i'm going to use a high copy um a high copy number plasmid which means that i'm going to have a high yield however keep in mind that when you use a high copy plasmid you put a lot of stress on your bacteria and so the bacteria functioning reduces right as compared to if you're using a low copy number you're going to put a lot of stress on the the metabolism of the bacteria and then the bacteria stresses out and then you're going to have a lot of issues right so those are some of the things you have to look out for and then you also have to look at whether it is episomal or it's an integrative vector, right? So is the vector um, backbone that you've chosen, is it going to incorporate your system into the genome of the bacteria, right? Or the, whatever host that you have, or it is going to stay as an independent um, piece of DNA inside the bacteria, right? So these are a lot of features that you have to use. And you also have to look at the host strain compatibility, right? Some vector backbones work in yeast, other backbones working um bacteria so you have to look at what host what strain are you using what 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 host are you using what strain are you using and then you can decide what um backbone that you need to select right um brings your questions in the chat i'm on stop codon and the copy number Right. Um, it is important because now the stop codon is important because it stops. So basically, when you are translating, right, um, when the protein is folding, it knows the stop codon function. So, for example, if I have like a very long thread, and then one second. Okay. Right. I don't know. Can you see my screen? Well, can you see me? Yeah, we can see yeah. you and we can see the screen. Right. So let's assume um this here is a this is a, ma a magnetic bead, by the way. Let's assume here this is a protein, right? Or a, a sequence that is going to form a protein. Now, this each of this is um, a particular amino acid, right? Now, with a stop codon being in there, it tells the back um, the protein after it's been expressed, like basically it if influences how it is going to fold. Is that okay? It influences how it's going to be fold. So if you don't have, so the fact that you have that there means that okay, then when the protein is expressed, then the folding and then the functionality of the protein is going to be different. So it doesn't stop the functioning of the the um, RNA polymerase, right? It doesn't stop the stop codon doesn't stop the function of the RNA polymerase, right? But then what happens is that when it's expressed, that protein is going to be formed separately from um if there is another protein um, attached to it, okay? And it influences how the secondary structure and um, the function, the functionality of the entire protein is gonna um, behave, right? But then the stop codon, BM, no, the, um, the terminator being there forces the whole RNA polymerase to fall off. And then you are, so when it falls off, then you know that, okay, I am done. So this is the entire size of what I'm trying to produce. But then if this is, let's say, this is the, this is your long DNA that you're trying to send. Um, this is the long DNA, right? So this is your your plasmid, right? Let's say this is your plasmid. But then you want to produce only this um this small piece here, right? If you don't put a promoter there, the bacteria is going to uh, the RNA polymerase is going to keep um or it's going to assume that you want to express whatever is at the back there. Meanwhile, that is not what you are interested in. Does that make sense? Right. And then um, what is the difference between the copy number uh, and the copy number variation? Uh, what my this thing is right, one second. Right. Um, so the copy number is the copy number of a plasmid, right? Like, so if you talk about the plasmid copy number, it is how many. Um, that is different from the um, copy number variation um, of a genome, right? That is different, that's like the entire genome. But then the copy number here is talking about 
um, how many of that secular plasmid can be made within one single bacteria, right? Um, and that's why I was saying that depending on the, the origin of application, um, that influences the copy number. You can have as low as like something like a 30, 20 um, plasmids in a bacteria, and then as high as like 700, 800 um, copies of that secular plasmid in a bacteria, right? All right, um, right. I'm going to run through um, these a bit um, because I know most likely you do it again in your next lecture. Um, so I'm going to run through this a bit, but if you have any question, you can stop me and ask me about that. Um, so we're going to talk about, I'm going to skip um, one of them and then only talk about um, the type 2 as um, cloning assembly. So I have like two or three um, cloning assemblies, but I'm going to skip some of them because we are out of time and then only talk about um, the type 2 as restriction um, enzyme type of cloning. And I'm going to talk about um, the Golden Gate assembly, right? Um, so the Golden Gate assembly standard basically uses um, type 2 as restriction enzymes like BSA1, BBS1, right? Now, what this um, enzyme does is that um, it cuts away from um, the recognition site and leaves a four base pair overhang, right? So what you see over here, so on the, what you have here, so the enzyme has a recognition sequence. So what you see here is a, is a BSA1 recognition site, right? So the GGTCTC is a, um, it's only BSA1 that recognizes this particular um, sequence. So what it's going to do is that it's going to cut away from um, that recognition site and leave a four base pair overhang on the DNA fragment that you have. Now, that being in mind, so what is going to happen is that, so for example, you have um, this piece of DNA here, you have that piece of DNA here, right? What is going to happen is that when you cut, it's going to leave a four base pair overhang at the bottom here. And this is going to leave a four base pair overhang at the top here. And now you have four base pair overhang at the bottom of one DNA, you have four base pair overhang at the top of your other fragment that you want to put together, then it can come together. Now, the catch here is that you have to design your system in such a way that the four base pair overhang that is going to be left when your type 2 S restriction enzyme cuts on the end of one gene, right? So let's say you have gene A, B, C, D that you want to put together, right, to form your sequence, right? Now, you have to make sure that when the BSA1 cuts at the end of so you want to put b at the end of a c at the end of b and like that right you have to make sure that the four base pair overhang that is going to be left at the end of a when the bsa1 cuts is complementary to what is going to be left at the front or the 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 um upstream of um your b when the bsa1 cuts and with that in mind then they are going to like get together does that make sense Right. So that is the whole principle. Now we realize they realize that, oh, when you cut a system with BSA one side, it's going to leave this particular um, overhang there. So then they capitalize on that to design um, this coding gate assembly um, system. So as I said, when it cuts, so let's say this is your A, this is your B. When it cuts, it's going to leave this piece here, which is um, a four base pair overhang. And then at the end of your other one, it's going to be a four base pair overhang. And then with that in mind, you can put your DNA pieces together. And then the catch is that it has to be complementary, right? Um, so your question is, are the restriction enzymes engineered? Um, the restriction enzymes were originally found in um, organisms, right? They were originally found in organisms. Now, so the short story is that restriction enzymes were a way that the bacteria was protecting themselves from um, bacteriophages, right? So um, when bacteria is infected by a virus, what you call a bacteriophage, um, they use a restriction enzyme to chop the, the genome of um, the bacteriophage into pieces and then destroy it thereby making it inactive, right? So that is where um, they learned um, that idea from, right? So they were originally found in um, organisms, but there has been modifications and engineering on some of these things that has made it much more robust um, in basically cutting and making it very precise in cutting, right? So the answer is yes and no. No, because they were originally found in um, organisms. And yes, because over the years, the, the genome or the, the coding sequence has been optimized 
and now the restriction enzymes are being produced out of robust nature and um, high fidelity, right? Okay, so back to this. So you have your pieces. So you're going to cut um, your pieces and you're going to cut your backbone as well. And then when you put it together, you have that. Now you realize that when I was talking about um, the vector backbone, I mentioned something called the multiple cloning sites, right? So the multiple cloning sites in an empty backbone is like a region where there is a chunk of um, restriction enzyme cut sites in there, right? So based on what restriction enzyme cut sites you have in there and what cut sites you have designed on your on your system, then you can easily dis, um, digest and then like get those systems to put together, to put your, your DNA piece into the vector backbone before you give it to um, the bacteria to um, express whatever you want to express. Right, so up here, you realize that um, you digest your backbone um, and then you digest your your you digest your um, your ends uh, your piece your DNA fragment you digest the backbone and then here you do the ligation. Now what you use to do the ligation is what we call the T four ligase. Commonly what we call the T four ligase, but there's also the the T seven ligase. But most commonly what we use is the T four ligase. Uh right. There was supposed to be a video here, but it's not playing. I don't know why. But right. So. In order to do this, there are a couple of ways that you need to do this, right? <clears throat> if you want to <clears throat> send out your DNA sequence, <clears throat> sorry. If you want to send out the DNA sequence to be synthesized by a company, then what you're going to do is that you're going to introduce this um, BSA-1 cut site with the overhangs that you've specifically engineered to be complete. So for example, if you want your promo, so this, let's say this is the sequence that I want, right? I'm not using any um tags i'm not using any reporter genes i want to just put these three pieces together so you have to make sure that the end of your um promoter is compatible the four base pair overhang that's going to be at the end of your promoter is compatible with um what is um in front of your coding sequence and likely the end of your put what is at the and then um reaction and then is going to put them together. So, make sure that the DNA sequence that you use the cut side, the four base pair over the enzyme, the enzyme. Good that you are able to how is that thing and then you how to do it so on DNA I can piece out that from a human body and then put it in the bacteria. If you can do that, hallelujah, that's fine. So what you basically have to do is that you design primers, right? Um, primers are short oligonucleotides that allow you to make more copies of a DNA. So you design primers, and in your primers, you're going to include that um, cut site, that um, restriction enzyme cut site, recognition site with your overhang. So what is going to happen is that when you put your um, primers in the reaction together with the, <clears throat> the human um, DNA, it is going to PCR or make more copies of just the, the DNA that code for the insulin, right? And then because now you have the DNA that codes for insulin, and then in that making the copies of it, you introduced the um the new um piece, which is the recognition side. Now you can digest that with the BSA one or whatever <clears throat> restriction enzyme you used, and now you can put it together with other um um pieces using the um the T4 like this, right? So there are two things, right? Design your sequence, send it out to a company to synthesize it for you, or you design primers and then um, you PCR out that part and then you put it together. I've done both of them and I'll tell you that if you have money, send it out to a company to synthesize for you. If you don't have money, then you PCR, but PCR is a very long stretch of work and then you have to do purification and it's quite tedious. But So if you have money, you can just send it out for a company to synthesize for you. That makes life very easier. But it doesn't mean you should do that, right? So I said, as I said, I'm going to skip um, this one. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, Right, and then I'm gonna do this one and then I'm gonna to jump to something else and then we are basically gonna wrap up um, this session.
Right. So as I said from the beginning, you need a promoter, you need RBS, you need a tag, you need a reporter, you need a cleavage, you need coding sequence, you need a terminator. Now you realize that your promoter, so here I, I just basically assume that the RBS at the end of the promoter. That's why you don't you don't see RBS in here, right? I just assume that the RBS at the end of the promoter, right? Um, because then because your RBS has to be just after the promoter, it doesn't change. If you put your RBS here, then nothing here gets expressed gets expressed, right? If you put your RBS here in front of your coding sequence here, then nothing here is going to get expressed and you're going to have yourself wanting when you're, you don't see what you're looking for, right? However, everything else here can be interchanged, right? So you can say, okay, I want to do promoter first. I want to do a tag. I want to do a reporter. I want to do cleave. I want to do coding sequence. I want to do a terminator. I want to do, right, okay. I missed something. I didn't talk about the cleave. Oh, sorry. Right, I'm going to just mention it in a bit. So you realize that we talked about the fact that you put affinity tags um, on your proteins and then affinity tag helps you um, separate your express protein from um, any other piece of, um, or whatever the bacteria um, proteins are. <clears throat> now, when you do that, what then is gonna happen is that you have a purified protein, but it's not just your protein of interest. You have your protein of interest and then you have an affinity tag to it, right? So what a cleave does is that it's a piece of enzyme that is going to basically cleave off um, that tag and then leave your proteins alone. So what you basically have to do is that, so for example, if you use a, just like what we did up there, if you have a resin um, column, you're going to pick a new column and then run your, your cleaved um, solution through that. And then what is going to happen is that the affinity tag is going to tag to the resin in the column and then your proteins are going to come out. And then now you have like a very pure protein which is void of any um, affinity tags, right? So that is the, the importance of the cleave that we have over here. Right. So again, as I said, in the middle here, you can rearrange it in any format that you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, however, the terminator must always be at the end and then the promoter must always be at the front. Right. Right. Um, we have a collection of um some some um promoters, some affinity tags, some reporters, some we have a collection of them. What I'm gonna do um in a bit is um I'm just gonna change my screen and then show you what it is. And um we're gonna just run through a bit, but I'm gonna leave this and go to the next slide and I'll come back to that. Um so useful tools in um designing your genetic circuits. We have um so I basically use two of them, the bench link and then the snap gene. Snapgene, you have to pay for it, and I don't have money. So I use Benchlink, which is free, basically free. Um, you can do whatever you want to do with that. Um, so with Benchlink, you can um do a digestion, you can do a PCR, like virtual PCR to see how your system is going to look like, right? You can do all that on that. You can see if your if let's say you put a PSA one cut site in front of your sequence, what is going to happen is that you can try and digest that and see if indeed your your design is correct, right? So if you want to leave a a four base pair overhang, you can cut on bench link and then see if um, indeed what you design is correct before you send it out for, to a company to synthesize for you, right? So this helps you do all the in silico designs and all the in silico testing and all that. And over here, you can do all the um, coding gate assembly I mentioned over there. You can do that on this platform to see if your system works before you actually go to the lab to try and um, do all that in the lab, right? Um, and then the one on the right is a snap gene. Um, I just recorded a video. So it's basically showing you um, everything that you can do. But most of the things that snap gene can do, Benchlink can do them. But Benchlink is free. Snap gene, you have to pay. And we don't have money. So we use Benchlink. Um, right. Okay. So there are two, two designs that I just want us to look at. And then um, we just go back to um, the last couple of things I'm going to show you. And then we wrap up for the day. So the first one is um so these are two designs that the Ashasi team did um this year. Um so they were trying to um detect some elements um from the environment um and then basically to the design a circuit where um they use a promoter um to detect those elements and then if the element is present, then the bacteria is going to change color to show you that okay, this particular element um is present in your in the environment, right? So they had their promoter, they had their RBS, and then they had the infrared. So the infrared is a, a chromoprotein, and then they had their terminator. And then what they did was that they used the bio brick, and then they used it. So there is a BSA one at the end here. So this 
basic one design over here allows them to put this design into a vector backbone, right? And a vector backbone that they chose at the multiple cleaning side, it has it has BSA one cast side there as well. So then they were able to easily put um their design sequence into um the BSA one cast site. I mean the vector backbone. And then what you see at the bottom here was another design from the Ashesi team as well. So because they were deploying their system into the environment or they want to deploy their system into the environment, they thought about making their system very safe, right? So they look for a UV promoter, right? So a promoter that is triggered by the presence of UV. And then, so basically what they were trying to say is that, okay, if the bacteria senses UV in the environment, then this promoter should be triggered and then this protein should be produced. Now this protein is a T4 endolysin. Um, and then what this protein does is that it eats up the bacteria from the inside, right? So then it's gonna eat the bacteria from the inside and then end up killing the bacteria from the inside. And by doing that, you avoid, um horizontal gene transfer because all the components of the bacteria are going to be chewed up. And so nothing um, genetic wise comes out of the bacteria into the environment to um, affect whatever other organisms that live naturally in the environment, right? So these are the two designs that they had. And so I just use that, I just brought it here basically to give you an idea of the many things that you can achieve, the many things that you can do basically um, if you just look at it. Um, yeah, right. Um, I'm going to change my screen for a bit and then show you the system right here. Can you see my what I'm what I'm sharing? Yeah, we can yeah. see your screen. Okay. So this tool right here, um this tool here is something that um the Open Bioeconomy Lab, I myself and a couple of other collaborators, what we did was um we found some promoters, some RBS um some purification tags some cleave domains um and then some coding sequence so mostly all the coding sequence here are things that you can use oh sorry right so the coding sequence are the ones that are here right so the coding sequence here are um they basically produce enzymes that you can use to do diagnostics and use um in the lab right to do pcr to do um lamp and to do all those things so we found a lot of them that are off patents right so yeah, of patent, meaning that the public has access to this, right? And then, um, so we basically have this system here, right? And what is going to happen is that, okay, so let's say you start from here, right? And then we have carefully designed it in such a way that I'm going to go through in a bit, in like five minutes, and then maybe you can understand. If you don't understand, um, hit me up, and then I'll take you through it at another time, not right now. Right, so you choose from any of these promoters, right? Um, this right here is a quantity promoter, right? So you can choose a T7 or a LAC or a PTAC or whatever, right? Now you realize that in our design, so we're using the Golden Gate Assembly Standards, right? So you realize that whatever promoter you choose, at the end of it, right, when you digest with BSA1, right, at the, um, the forward part of it, so let's say the from the rear end and then the forward end, right? So on the end here, when you digest with BSA1, it's going to produce this overhang and then it's going to allow you to put it into a vector backbone, right? That also has a BSA1 cut site in there, right? So you realize that at the end here, it's going to produce this particular overhang at the forward side of the promoter. And then at the back side of the promoter, it's going to produce this particular overhang here. So whatever RBS you choose, right? Whatever RBS you choose from this sequence, right? Whatever RBS you choose from this sequence, when you digest it, it's going to produce um this overhang, right? And then you continue to um so at the front of the RBS, the overhang that is going to produce is compatible to the the back of the promoter, right? The five prime end of the promoter, and then likewise, right? However, let's say you don't want to use a um, you don't want to use a purification tag. You just want to do um a promoter RBS coding sequence and then. Terminator, right? Let's say that's what you want to do. So what we did was that we created a super linker, right? So let me show you right here. Right. So this super linker here, uh, right. No, 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 no. Okay. Right. This super linker here, right, allows you to link your RBS directly with a coding sequence. Right. So you don't have to go through all these pieces over here. Right. So for example, if you just want 
a promoter RBS and then go to your coding sequence. Then the next thing you choose, so if you choose your promoter, you choose your RBS, the next thing you have to choose is one of these. And one of these allows you to connect your RBS directly to a coding sequence, thereby bypassing all these. If you don't do that, and then you just ignore the superlinker here, what is going to happen is that when you try to digest your system, it's going to produce over hands that are not going to be compatible, right? So then that is basically what I'm trying to say. So if you want to just do um, promoter RBS all the way to um, coding sequence, then you have to use this particular superlinker. Now, if you want to do um, promoter RBS and then a purification tag, but you don't want the, the cleavage, right? You don't want any cleave, um, cleaving DNA, then you have to use this superlinker here, right? You have to use this link here. Right, and this allows you to bypass um this cleave over here. I hope that makes sense, right? If you don't understand, just hit me up, right? Um, and so it goes on like that, right? So the the super linkers, you basically have to look at where the super linker exists and then see um where you can skip, right? So if there's a super linker from here to here, it means that it allows you to skip from um, after the RBS, so with this superlinker here, right? So with this superlinker two here, it means that it's going to allow you to skip from um at the end of your RBS all the way to the front of what your um uh your your coding sequence, right? So superlinker two allows you to skip from RBS to um coding sequence. Superlinker um flexible here allows you to skip from um, purification tag and domain, and then go straight to um the N three um domain here. Um, and then again, if you don't want so the super linker again here allows you to skip from this C one C two and C one C two are all um again purification tags and um click domains, so it allows you to skip all those ones. And when you look at this um super linker six here, it allows you to skip all the way from to the end of your coding sequence all the way to where you want to use your terminator. Right. So let's say in your design, all you needed was a promoter RBS coding sequence terminator. Then you're going to pick one promoter here, one RBS, super linker two, because it allows you to skip from the end of your RBS to the front of your coding sequence. You're going to pick a coding sequence, and then you're going to pick super linker three that allows you to skip um what is in the middle and then go to then you pick a terminator. Right, and then you use your vector backbone. But if you want to use a a purification tag, whether at the front or at the back. So what we have here is purification tag at the front with a cleave domain, and then a purification tag at the back with a cleave domain. Right, and you realize that the cleave domain is always close to your coding sequence. Right, so the cleave domain is in between your coding sequence and the purification tag, not the other way around. Right, so. By doing that, you're able to what, cleave off your um your um, purification tag away from your coding sequence. But if you don't want any of that, you then know, you can just use um these super linkers to skip um all of these um processes, right? Right. So these are some of the things we design for people that want to basically produce some of these enzymes easily, um without any stress, without having to worry about what the design is going to be like, what the um, compatibility is and all those things. So this system here basically allows you to do that. Now, this is not very comprehensive to com include everything else in the world. We don't have that, right? So for example, in one of your assignments, I ask you to design something, right? So you can choose to use any of this stuff here, but in this coding sequence based on, so for example, if you want to produce um the vitamin B12, what you have to do is to go and find the protein sequence that codes, the sequence that codes for vitamin B12, and then that is where you're going to put up your, your coding sequence here, right? And then you can choose any of the promoters and then the purification tags and then the cleaves. And then you can choose any of them, right? So basically, um, this system here, you can have access to it. Um, I'm going I think this is a clone version. The original one is there because I know some people might mess it up, but right. So this is the original version here. So if you want the sequence, all you have to do is when you click on it, there is a link here that takes you to a bench link site. And then when you take it to the bench link side, all you can do is just copy the sequence and then you can, so right, so this is the sequence. You can just copy the sequence and then use it to do whatever you want to do, right? What you are seeing here 
what the DNA, don't worry about it. The DNA stuffer is that the sequence that we originally had to do um that particular thing, the histag, is a very, very short um sequence, right? It's a very, very short sequence. So we put a DNA stuffer there. The DNA stuffer is like it's just a piece of DNA that is doesn't function, doesn't do any function. We put it there just to make the sequence quite long to allow for the synthesis and allow you to easily be able to work with it, right? So um that brings us to our, the end of our lesson. I am going to um let me stop sharing for a second. I'm going to copy. I don't know how um Kato, how do they have access to the assignment? Um, do they have access to it already? Do I have to send the link here? Is Kato here? Um, I don't think so. Okay, so I'm just going to um copy the assignments link and then send it in the chat here. I think it's going uh, to be sent through email. Oh, it's going to be sent through email. Okay, right. I think That's so. fine. Yeah. Right. That's fine. So I'll get um Heidi to send. Oh, you um, could the... send if it's possible. You could still send it here, and then they could send it through email. Ah, he said well. I send it here. Okay. So let me just send it here. Um, one second. Um. Oh, okay. The last time you got it here. That's fine. Okay. What's the problem? Right. Um, the questions are pretty easy. I think so. Um, um, the last question, if you, if you need anything, just, just, um, let me know, right? If you need to, um, um, where is the chat? If you need me to go through anything with you, you can hit me up, um, directly and then I will, um, do that for you. Oh, oh. All right. Um, so I've sent it. And um, if you need me, you can find me on um Discord. Uh or you can reach out to Rosemond directly and then Rosemond will assist you. Or you can reach out to me directly. Um and then I will assist you in um whatever um you need, right? Okay, so my email is down here. Um, if you need any further assistance, reach out to me or reach out to Rosemont and then um, we should be able to take care of it for you, right? Any question? We are almost done. Five minutes. We are almost done. Any question? Any feedback? Oh, are we okay? Are we all okay? Just give me thumbs up. Just just give me thumbs up and let me know if you're okay. Great. Great. I've got one thumbs up. Good. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you all. Um, please make sure you've copied the assignment at uh, the link. Um, so that if I end the call, you get it. But I'll ask Heidi to send um the email to all of you so that you have access to it as well. Right. Um, until then. Thank you for joining my session and have a good evening or morning or I don't know the time, but yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you.